So I'd like to thank the Minnesota Historical Society for inviting me. I'd like to thank Annie Johnson for her work in hosting me. I'd like to thank Mike in the back who, who mic'd me up and Megan who's doing the live uh, captioning. And I'd also like to thank the Organization of American Historians, which promotes excellence in scholarship, teaching, and the presentation of American history, and which encourages wide discussion of historical questions. As a historian, I've always considered history to be important to civic life, as well as personally meaningful. To live only in the present, I think, is a mere 3D existence, and to know something about the past opens up an entire new dimension of human experience. It's also essential for us to understand history so that we can critically evaluate historical claims, such as those recently made by Putin to justify his attack on Ukraine. You clearly share these sentiments or you would not be here today. So although my heart lies in Ukraine today, my talk speaks to three of the issues in current public debates over US history. The first is whether history should skew more towards laudatory myth-making or towards critical analysis. The second is whose perspectives and stories matter in our national histories. And the third issue is how should we position our nation in the wider scheme of global history? Should we consider it as always and inevitably exceptional or as thoroughly woven into the larger fabric of the world? These are all issues that I grapple with in my book on the American heartland, which I'll be drawing on for my talk. Although the Midwest has been labeled an overlooked part of the country in national history, and indeed has been depicted dismissively by outsiders as flyover country, which you see in this illustration in the upper left, which is from a series of maps that people in the UK were asked to fill out to label what they could about the United States. So you'll notice they get some things like Texas, I know it's a little blurry, you know, they get Texas right. Um, they, don't label Minnesota as Minnesota, but if it's any comfort, they don't label my state as Minnesota either. Instead, it's just flyover country, this vast emptiness of the, the Midwest. Um, so although the Midwest has been dismissed as flyover country um, and described by regional boosters as a lost region, which then we need to know more about to make it unlost, the Midwest has played a significant role in national mythologies. And I'm thinking specifically about the rural Midwest um, and its role in the heartland myth, which is generally understood as referencing the rural Midwest. The heartland myth holds that there is an inner essence or symbolic center of the United States. This national heart is understood as insulated, exceptionalist, and isolationist as the ultimate national safe space that must be guarded against outside dangers at all costs. So I'm going to start really quickly with a few images, popular culture images that I pulled off the web. If you Google the word heartland, you'll get a lot of hits for the rural Midwest, um, a lot of pictures of grain production, uh, livestock, uh, you know, notice the horse-drawn team here, um, and the Angus uh, beef in the middle of the next slide. The red barns that are associated with family farms also seem to be an emblem of the heartland. Uh, you also get hits for things like crafts, Christmas, nostalgic small towns and Christian schools, and flags and conservative politics. As these images suggest, in popular usage, the term heartland has come to connote a rural, white, Christian, and quintessentially all-American place. Ironically, the seeming heart of the United States does not really accurately represent the United States as a whole. The heartland myth is more than nostalgic, it is exclusionary. Well, lest you conclude, well, of course, the heartland has always signified a kind of backward looking rural Americana, I'll note that the term did not emerge in reference to a nostalgic, inward looking, bunkered repository of national essence. To the contrary, it was coined by a British geographer named Sir Halford Mackinder in 1904 to refer to a geostrategic pivot point. So the leading theories of global strategy um, prior to that time were navalist theories that had to do with whoever controlled the sea lanes would be well positioned for global dominance. So these were theories that captured, for example, the British empire's approach um, to power. But Mackinder said that there is this area, um, let me see if the, um, Laser will work, the pivot area, and whoever controls it will control Eurasia. And then if you control Eurasia, 
you'll control the inner uh, periphery and the outer um, crescent, and then you can establish global dominance. Um, so, let's see, I was going to comment on Ukraine because, in essence, this is um, one of the issues that is at stake in that conflict. The term came into widespread circulation in the United States during World War II in reference to the struggle over the Eurasian heartland, including, um, as I was just referring to, the war-torn places that are in the news today. After the war, Cold Warriors continued to use the term in reference to Soviet efforts to control Eurasia. In the immediate aftermath of World War II, Americans also began to apply the term to their own landmass and the power base that it could provide. Commentators began to affix the word heartland to the US Midwest, using it alongside terms such as the Middle West or Midlands. References to the industrial heartland were references to the source of American power that was radiating around the world. And this photograph here of the Gary Works US Steel um, gets a, this sense of the heartland, the sense of industrial might. The idea of the American heartland is a center of global power gave way, however, to the more nostalgic take on the heartland that we started with during the early Cold War. The heartland of myth is not the heartland of ethnically and racially mixed industrial workforces or urban populations, um, such as these men who came from Mississippi to work in the foundries of Beloit during the great migration of World War I, or the shoppers on Rondo Avenue in the aftermath of World War II. To the contrary, the mythical heartland is figured in opposition to the racial and ethnic diversity of the United States as a land of farmers of Northern European descent. This heartland came to seem endangered, not only by urban populations, but also by foreign threats in the age of long range bombers and intercontinental ballistic missiles. Thus, rather than connoting a wellspring of power, the heartland came to suggest national vulnerability. It came to signify an imperiled heart of the nation in need of protection from the outside world. These conceptions of the heartland have not been limited to popular culture. This became clear to me when I moved to Illinois from the East Coast around the end of the Cold War, or what appeared to be the end of the Cold War. I have to say, you know, there was a certain amount of hubris at the time an assumption that it was in fact over. And I think those assumptions are up for question now, uh, which reminds me of the old saw, the past doesn't change, but the present certainly does. But back in the past when the Cold War was over, globalization was the hot topic of the day, as we can see in the New Yorker cartoon that I used to show in one of my uh, classes, which says, grab some later hose in, and I showed it in History 274. We're about to climb aboard the globalization bandwagon. Well, I've been reading a lot of scholarship at the time I moved on the Atlantic world, the Pacific war, uh, rim, global cities, uh, borderlands, um, military bases, uh, major tourist sites. And I realized upon moving to Illinois that none of these places seem to be inland places or especially rural inland places. And the moment that was the eureka moment for me was in fact the day I moved to Illinois and I woke up um, and turned on the radio and out came the weather forecast for China, Argentina and Brazil. And I realized that nothing on the East Coast had prepared me for that, nothing in my readings about globalization, which had written off the rural Midwest as somehow backward and isolated in contrast to places like New York City or Los Angeles. And I realized that I had bought into the heartland myth um, of the Midwest as a relatively local uh, place um, as what some historians have labeled the isolationist capital of America um, by failing to recognize that it had its own largely um, hidden in the scholarship of the time histories of connection. So as I came to realize that although Midwestern cities such as Chicago had been recognized as global uh, places. M my own town in East Central Illinois had been implicitly mapped as a left behind place in all the histories that I've been reading, which had a certain politics to them insofar as they valued connectedness as a sign of cultural attainment, of modernity, of higher status, and that devalued um, 
locality and seeming disconnectedness as somehow a kind of lesser um, way of being. So then thinking about the weather report and the scholarship I'd been reading, I decided to dig into the history of the Midwest and um, that led ultimately to my book. And more specifically, I thought I would consider the Midwest in a seemingly most local time, by which I mean the time between European um, contests for colonial domination in North America and the World War I era in which the United States is recognized as rising to great power status and being increasingly involved in the world. So I wanted to look at the years in between. I picked my new home, Champaign County, which you see on the map in East Central Illinois as a starting point, but importantly, it's not the ending point for my story. Rather than following the pattern of many local histories, which start with the site unit and then just fill in the map, um, sticking to that site unit, I just started to, decided to start with a particular place and then to see where the stories would lead me. My intent in that respect was bigger than understanding the history of a specific county. It was to see what local history might look like if we try to understand place by looking both in and out. This approach differed from a lot of the antiquarian histories that I began to read. These tended to be relentlessly inward looking with plenty of coverage of things like the first school in the county, uh, the achievements of leading citizens. But then I realized that these histories weren't just reporting on locality, they were inventing it. And they were doing so for political reasons. Immigrants were pouring into central Illinois from states ranging from New Hampshire to North Carolina and from places such as Ontario, England, Scotland, Ireland, Switzerland, Hanover, Bavaria, and the kingdom of Württemberg. Some recently arrived settlers had moved several times already before arriving in central Illinois. Some had come from places such as Havana, Cuba. A number of newcomers had traveled widely before moving to Illinois. Settlers included slave traders, drovers, salesmen, and sailors. Many residents featured in these histories continued to travel for commercial reasons. Some went to California and Pikes Peak in search of gold. Some served in Mexico during the Mexican-American War. Many of them served in the Civil War, um, including the individual who I've pictured on this slide. And some served in what is now the US West in the context of Indian Wars. They and their children often left for opportunities, um, including cheaper land, recently wrested from Indians in places such as Kansas, Texas, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, the Dakotas, and a particular note to this audience, Minnesota. So this little clip from the Urbana Union newspaper, 1899, has to do with home seekers excursions in which railroads would run special trains for people looking to buy farmland in um, uh, places such as Minnesota, Northern Iowa, the Dakotas, and, and so forth. And yet, going back to local histories, through publishing local histories, the residents of Midwestern counties, such as Champaign, were declaring themselves to be local despite their amazing mobility. They were declaring themselves to be the people who literally owned the place and who should be deferred to as community leaders. They were making that claim not only in opposition to newcomers and working class, poor and transient people who barely figure in their historical accounts, their local histories at all, but also they were making these claims of being local in contrast to the people they displaced. The people they forced out were not local either. And I'm going to take the Kickapoo Nation as one example of that. At the time of Christopher Columbus, most Kickapoos were living in what is now the Detroit, Michigan, Windsor, Ontario area. But because of the violence that followed from the fur trade, uh, Kickapoo people began moving south and west into um, increasingly present day Indiana, and, and the dots represent Kickapoo villages, Illinois, and Wisconsin. In addition to moving over the course of years, they were seasonally mobile. So in the warmer months of the year, Kickapoo women would plant crops. And then in the colder months of the year, in smaller groups, the Kickapoos would disperse from their villages to hunt over uh, wider distances. The pioneers who had by definition come from someplace else 
dismissed the Kickapoo's claims to place in Illinois by saying that they were unsettled rovers. So this is a reference not only to their movement over time, but to their seasonal mobility. Kickapoo's did indeed travel widely, and not only for those seasonal um, hunting um, that I referenced um, and um, um, note on the map, you know, that there is written evidence of Kickapoo's going into um, Minnesota, um, but they also um, traveled um, for reasons of diplomacy, uh, to obtain um, rare trade goods, and from curiosity and a desire to see the world. I'll say that the meaning of the word Kickapoo is he moves about standing now, here, now, there. So the very definition of group identity had to do with mobility. This map indicates some of the places that we know from written records that the Kickapoos went to in the 19th century. And I don't have the UK on this map, but there is some evidence that Kickapoos also traveled to London, England as part of a traveling group of indigenous performers in the mid 19th century. Yet much of this mobility increasingly was involuntary. It resulted from colonial violence. Seeing themselves as the true locals, the pioneers forced most Kickapoos uh, to the west of the Mississippi in the early 19th century. They also precipitated more mobility by destroying the Kickapoos foodstuffs, um, by depleting game, and by causing the Kickapoos to need to travel in pursuit of diplomatic alliances and safety from attacks. Some Kickapoos moved to Mexico where they obtained a community land grant, um, also called an ejido in Coahuila, um, this Mexican state. And the village, the main Kikapu village is not in Nacimiento, Mexico, which you see uh, here on the map. Um, and then subsequently, another group of Kikapu um, moved to um, uh, Sonora, um, Mexico. Oh, and I'll also note that the painting on the upper right-hand side of the screen shows a delegation of Kickapoos who traveled to Mexico City during the temporary reign of Emperor Maximilian, who um, Europeans put on the um, Mexican throne, um, who had a short tenure there before he was deposed. And the delegation went to Maximiliano to request the land grant, which they then got in Coahuila. So the question is, why did some Kickapoos choose to relocate to the arid lands of Northern Mexico, which had very little resemblance to the Great Lakes region that they had come from? I mean, completely different ecologies. So you think about these people traveling to Sonora and just, you know, it boggles the mind, like how would you know how to survive in a desert-like environment if you come from this, you know, swampy uh, Great Lakes area? And indeed, I'll also note that mid 20th century anthropologists who studied Kickapoos in Nascimento noted the Kickapoo women before owning trucks and other vehicles was widespread among Kickapoos would travel for several days in public transportation using buses and trains to get to swampier parts of Mexico to harvest cattails, which they used to build their wikiups, which are traditional um, Great Lakes uh, Algonquin um, dwellings. So back to the question, why would Kickapoos move to Mexico? Well, one of the reasons is that Kickapoos experienced US colonialism, not only as a matter of displacement, but also as a matter of forced localization. They were forced onto reservations in Kansas and Oklahoma that they could not leave without passes, which were not always granted, and without armed guards. They had to have a US military guard go with them if they were able to get a pass to leave. Um, some were locked up in military posts, um, some ended up in the US penal system in jails, and I should note that incarceration was alien to the Kickapoo system of justice, which tended to be based more on physical uh, punishment or restitution um, in the event of crimes. In times of pandemic, Kickapoo people were subject to quarantines. They found it difficult to move through privatized landscapes, often fenced with barbed wire as the century um, progressed. Um, with reduced game that was available uh, uh, to them to subsist on if they were traveling. And in the case of the US South, that was patrolled by slave patrols. Children were forced to uh, sit in school all day where they learned geography from books uh, rather than uh, through uh, traveling to the landscape. Women were admonished to stay home and devote themselves to the uplifting job of housework, which you see on the lower right. And men who previously had not been the agriculturalist, agriculture was considered women's work, were admonished to go back and forth in their fields all day behind a plow. So for people who conceived of themselves to be constantly in motion, localization did not mean empowerment. 
To the contrary, for the Kickapoos, it meant being subject to colonial domination. Thus, one of the powerful attractions of Mexico was the ability to come and go as they pleased. Mexico offered both places that Kickapoo people could claim as their own, their ejidos, and also the ability to move unfettered through space. Yet even Mexico offered limited refuge as demonstrated by the 1873 Mackenzie Raid. In this raid, a US cavalry unit um, headed by Mackenzie rode about 80 miles into Mexico to kill and kidnap Kickapoos who were suspected of raiding across the border and rustling among other things, cattle, which we'll get to in a minute. They used their captives, the um, members of the McKinsey expedition as hostages to force other Kickapoos to relocate to the United States to a reservation in Oklahoma, then where they could be uh, localized, closely monitored and um, kept from um, further uh, raiding. Following the McKenzie raid, US investors with ties to Mexican officials took a lot of the land of the remaining Mexican Kickapoos. The US owned Rosita smelter, which you see on this slide, uh, later depleted and poisoned the Kickapoos water supply, forcing many Mexican Kickapoos then to turn to migratory agricultural labor, seasonal labor in the United States in order to survive. In the 1980s, some Kickapoo people were living literally on the US-Mexican border under the international bridge that connected Eagle Pass, Texas to Piedras Negras, um, Mexico. They had been able to cross the border for many years thanks to, and this is just mind blowing, notarized copies of an 1830, uh, copies of a notarized document rather from 1832 that a US army officer had written to grant Kickapoos the right of passage from the Detroit, Michigan, Windsor, Ontario area. And so they had this original document that then they would copy and notarize and it would enable them to cross from Texas um, into Mexico and back again. But in the 1980s, when Reagan era border agents began to make their crossings more difficult, they filed for US citizenship so they would have the right to enter the United States. Ironically, they claimed the McKenzie raid as a piece of evidence that demonstrated their right to US citizenship. But in filing for US citizenship, which the Texas uh, Kickapoo got, they insisted that they did not want to give up their Mexican citizenship. They wanted the right to cross the border in both directions because they had family members on both sides of the line. Rather than being either US or Mexican citizens, they wanted primarily to be Kickapoo, which meant not being walled in or out. The example of the Kickapoos provides a foil to the heartland myth. Their history counters the idea of the rural Midwest as a thoroughly local or a national safe space by virtue of its geographic position in the middle of the United States. Their history reminds us that if the Midwest is wider than other parts of the country, that is because of long histories of colonialism and diaspora. And their history suggests that local histories that draw sharp lines between insiders and outsiders miss out on histories of mobility, connection, and attachment to place, including among indigenous people in Mexico who consider the Midwest to be an important ancestral homeland. So now I'm going to turn to the transformation of the wet prairie. If the people of Illinois have never really been local, then neither has the landscape. Illinois is known as the, the prairie state, that's its moniker. But less than one tenth of 1% of Illinois is currently native tall grass prairie. And in fact, the prairie that you see here is not even in Illinois, it's in Oxford, England. It's a photo I took at the Botanical Garden, which you can see in the distance, uh, there's a stone wall that's kind of the tip off. This is not a typical Illinois uh, scene. Well, this transformation of the wet prairie is not just due to urbanization and suburbanization um, or suburban development. Agricultural transformation is also tremendously important to this ecological uh, change. Prior to the 19th century, the wet prairie of Illinois was so swampy and pondy that farmers in central Illinois in the wetter months of the year could row from their farmsteads across their fields for many miles like into the countryside. So farmers who wanted to be able to plant uh, grains and other uh, crops 
began to tile and drain their fields. Many of these farmers originally, uh, the, the people who introduced the technology were from Ostfriesland, which is the lowlands where the ne Netherlands meets uh, coastal Germany, which you see on the um, map. So um, I guess this is the close up and if, I guess it's a little bit hard to see in terms of how it, um, you know, how, how the map that's clear on my screen is being projected. Um, you can see the coastal Netherlands and uh, Germany. So these farmers who had experience trying to keep the North Sea out of their own field um, introduced techniques of tiling and draining, which meant digging, digging drainage ditches that would um, fast track water out of their fields and then lying, uh, laying tile under their fields that would channel water into these drainage ditches. So this map gets at one farmer's um, uh, drainage layout where the darker lines are the bigger ditches that he has and the smaller lines then are the um, smaller channels that would channel the water into the um, larger ditches. And the picture on the upper right is a tile factory. And you should know that the tiles were clay tiles are super heavy and very difficult to transport, expensive to transport long distances. So across the entire county, then these tiling operations sprung up to produce the tiles that then you know, didn't have to be shipped on long distances. So Illinois farmers in the 19th century, as they began to tile and drain their fields, laid enough tile using these European techniques um, that if all the tiles were laid end to end, they would circle the uh, earth six times. Um, and they massively then transformed Illinois um, and other places in the Midwest. I heard somebody give a talk on this in Iowa for, about Iowa history, for example, um, massively transformed it from wetlands into the rich agricultural area that it is um, today. One of the consequences of this tiling, as I said, is that it fast tracked water out of the fields towards the Mississippi River, and then ultimately from the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico. And currently this fast tracking also carries fertilizers um, and other runoff contributing to a massive dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico that is the size of Delaware. And it has algae blooms um, that choke off the oxygen that are needed by other organisms. Well, what the tiling and draining did is it made the Midwest suitable for larger scale agriculture, as we can see in this early 20th century photograph of a cornfield. And I'll note that the corn that the uh, Euro-American farmers of Illinois planted was not the same variety that the Kickapoos um, planted. Instead, they developed new hybrid varieties in part by importing new strains from Mexico for um, corn development um, purposes. Well, in addition to cultivating maize, Midwestern farmers introduced grains and fodder from other parts of the world as suggested by these photographs of sorghum, clover, timothy, wheat, um, oats, and significantly soy, which I'll get back to in just a second. Euro-American farmers also introduced a raft of new fruits and vegetables as seen, for example, in this nursery catalog that alludes to Swiss chard, Mengelwurzel beets, Brussels sprouts, and Schweinfurth cabbages. And where did these seeds come from? In addition to obtaining them from European nurseries, U.S. seed companies benefited from the labor of U.S. government bioprospectors who scoured the world looking for plants with economic potential in the late 19th and early 20th centuries that are now regarded as the golden age of bioprospecting. These plant scouts made the most of the imperial botanical gardens and the imperial infrastructures that granted them access to wide swaths of the globe. The soy that I showed earlier was one of their most significant introductions. And you should know that bioprospectors who were looking for crops that could be grown in the Gulf area would go more towards the Caribbean and Central America. But for people who were looking for crops that could be grown in the Midwest, they looked more towards East Asia and including Manchuria. And that's where the introduction um, of soy uh, strains um, were, were the soy that was introduced and in the um, early 20th century came from. The farmers of the Midwest um, also transformed the very soil in which all these plants grew by introducing micros microscopic uh, bacteria that had been imported from Germany because this bacteria had the capacity to fix nitrogen in the soil. They also introduced earthworms, which had been driven out of the region in the last ice age and had not yet returned. 
And through you know, their digestive processes, earthworms affect decomposition and thus the chemical makeup of the soil. Worms were just one of a whole raft of introduced animal species that helped make the seemingly all American place ecologically on American. As this illustration indicates, farmers introduced bees with the most popular variety being Italian bees. Their golden color was thought to be more attractive than the dull black color of native bees. And they were thought to be good pollinators of introduced plants. Larger farm animals also had recent immigrant roots, as we can see in this article on Polish fowls and these advertisements for Brahma, Udon, Hamburg, and Buff Cochin chickens. Cattle breeders paid top dollar for pedigreed short horn bulls and cows that could improve Midwestern herds. Many of these animals came from Canada, which had breeders with close connections to leading breeders in Scotland. Some of these animals became celebrities and many had aristocratic names. Adelaide, this beautiful cow pictured here, was the daughter of Lady Elgin, who in turn could count Wellington and Victoria among her progenitors. And keep that in mind, like these aristocratic animals that cost a ton of money where you can trace their ancestors back in herd books for generations. Keep that in mind because we're heading towards the Texas steers, which were regarded very differently. Livestock breeders from multiple countries had common investments in particular types of animals, and they did business and networked assiduously across borders, including in the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. You can see the stock exhibit area and sheds on this map. And I had known about the World's Fair for years. It was something I learned about as an undergrad. I taught about it in some of my classes, but had never realized just how big the livestock area of the fair was that most of the things I had read focused on the white city with the technology exhibits, the cultural exhibits, and on the midway, that went back from the lake that had the commercial entertainments and very little attention was paid in uh, accounts that I've been reading um, prior to starting this research on the agricultural um, dimensions of the fair. Well, these cross-border connections helped develop a sense of affinity with Northwestern Europe and um, especially to the UK. Additionally, it led to a sense that the Midwest and Ontario formed a single agricultural region. This sense was furthered by agricultural publications in the 19th century, which commonly treated the Midwest and Ontario as a border straddling unit. In addition to turning to breeding, Midwestern farmers looked to stay competitive, competitive in the face of Western ranching, turned to the feedlot, feedlot style of fattening of cattle that they purchased from Southwestern ranchers. So this illustration, gives you a sense of how the fattening worked where then farmers with their tiled and drained fields could start to grow more corn and then they could fatten animals that weren't you know, left to wander across the countryside but were fenced in and uh, fattened um, via corn that led to a more marbled, um, tastier product. Well, older accounts assumed that the industry, um, the Western ranching industry from which the animals to be fattened came from, stopped at the border. And you can see that in this account from 1961, the cattle kings, that's sort of like Mexico doesn't exist, right? Mexico is just this gray area to the south of Texas. But in actuality, the cattle kingdom straddled the border, um, as we saw, for example, with the Kickapoo people who were raiding across the border. Uh, Texan ranchers built up their herds by purchasing and rustling Mexican animals. And then, as I just noted, the purchases and the rustling went the other way. And cattle often independently would stray across the Rio Grande River. Thus, many of the cattle that ended up on Midwestern feedlots were actually Mexican in origin. Midwestern fatteners regarded these animals with disdain. They described longhorns, such as the one that is pictured here in front of the larger shorthorn animal that's to the rear. They regarded these longhorns as the degenerate descendants of the cattle brought to Mexico from Spain at the time of Cortez. Illinois farmers claimed that these animals had African ancestry going back to the Moorish conquest of Iberia. They argued that both Mexican herds and Mexican people were in need of racial uplift 
at that, and that men such as themselves should shoulder the task. Although the word Midwest brings to mind a place between the East and the West, the history of agricultural production can help us understand the Midwest as a place between North and South as well. That is a place where Northern and Southern borderlands converge. In a time when borders were still really fluid, Midwestern farmers advocated for closer, more fraternal ties to Canada, which they saw as a source of good stock. And as I said, as part of a common agricultural uh, area. In contrast, they argued for more hierarchical relations and more border patrolling with Mexico, which they regarded as a land of degenerate and poorly bred stock. And indeed, upon discovering that Mexican cattle carried a tick-borne disease, the US established border patrolling efforts uh, to regulate animal mobility across the US-Mexican border that served as precursors to later efforts to restrict human mobility. So now I'm going to tell you a couple stories about pigs. Travelers to Illinois in the mid-19th century deplored the state of its hogs. We can see this, for example, in the statement of an Englishman who, whose writings I have on this slide, who said the breed of hogs in this part of the country is very bad. They are long-nosed, thin creatures with legs like greyhound, and like the greyhound among dogs, seem to be the kind form for speed and agility among swine, as they think nothing of galloping a mile at a heat or of clearing fences, which a more civilized hog, I love that, more civilized hog would never attempt. The traveler admitted that such animals might be, and I'm quoting him, the best fitted for the backwoods, given their ability to fend for themselves, but yet only contempt for their savage nature. These animals were known for producing poor quality pork. And indeed the reputation of Midwestern pork was so bad that a British patent medicine company sold stomach pills to cure, and I'm quoting, the serious derangement caused by American pork. So let's see, it was accused of causing nervous stability and other complaints uh, arising from a disordered state of the digestive organs. Among the problems that might follow from eating American pork were windy spasms, headache, indigestion, giddiness, and nervous disability. So pork producers in the Midwest who wanted access to the higher end markets of Europe rather than just the low end markets of the plantation south, which included Caribbean sugar producing islands, thus imported hogs for breeding purposes, hoping to make a higher quality product. The most popular hog in the late 19th century was the Berkshire hog, which was bred in Berkshire, England by crossing Chinese pigs with old English pigs. So here we see the old English pig, the Chinese pig and the, the Berkshire uh, down at the bottom. So let me just explain <laughs> what was going on with pig breeding um, in this time period. So current scholarship thinks that the last common ancestor of the Chinese hog and the European hog prior to um, the 18th and 19th century was 7,000 years earlier. And then the ancient hogs uh, broke into two branches that no longer had contact with each other. And in Europe, as we can see from this medieval book of days, People kept hogs um, in, in uh, styes and fed them for certain months of the year. But what really made them worth keeping was they would let them out in the fall to forage for mass. So things like uh, acorns and beech nuts, right? That fell to the forest floor. And then they would fatten up so much in the fall months that it was worth feeding them to the other months. Um, but the issue with that was it was dangerous in the wolves uh, woods. There were predators, right? Uh, there were wolves and uh, wild boars. And so the pen kept hogs had to be able to fend for themselves out in the woods. And that meant a hardier animal, kind of like the pioneer hogs. And it also meant that they often interbred with wild boars. So European pigs then had like 7,000 years of development, which were um, similar to the, the pioneer um, hogs that were let um, uh, loose to, to forage for themselves in the woods. But in China, for that period of time, pigs tended to be kept in pens year round and fed household scraps and other things and were purposely bred without crossing with wild boars so that they would have longer intestines, which enabled them to um, eat more uh, nutrients out of the food that they were fed. So they would fatten more readily. So the Europeans then, when they started 
importing Chinese genetic material, we're able to get you know, close to a 7,000 year um, a shortcut uh, to developing a better animal. And we can see the English hog, a depiction of how, how um, wild it was prior to the introductions of genetic material. So back to the Berkshire. So the result of crossing them, the English pig and the Chinese pig was this total like weenie of a pig. It's like you could put it into a hot dog, but <laughs> eat it as it is almost. And never mind its Chinese ancestry, the fans of the Berkshire hog claimed that it was the ultimate Anglo-Saxonist pig. They asserted that it could fatten in any clime. They said like the British people, it was destined for global domination. And they said that it would uplift like British people lesser stock. Well, besides appreciating the Berkshire hog for its elite British credentials, and a lot of the, the British breeders were in fact, you know, aristocrats with landed estates, Illinois farmers appreciated it for its capacity to turn corn. Whoops, it got caught off on the bottom of the picture, but it, there's a picture of the, the ear of corn that the pigs are eating, um, as you can see where the arrow is. Farmers appreciated it for its capacity to turn corn into a non-greasy high-end pork. So the pig was in essence a corn laundering machine. But the problem was how to get the pork to market. So the first land grant railroad, the Illinois Central came to the rescue. So previous to the railroad, all the pork had to be floated down the Mississippi. And then the market, as I said, is the low end market of the plantation south. But once the railroad came in, it enabled shipping to the east, which I'll get to in just a second. But before I get there, I wanna say that when this was built, uh, the Illinois Central, which goes from Chicago down to New Orleans, in the 1850s, the United States was a capital short country. It did not have a lot of investment capital. So part, part of the financing was the land grant, but there was need for more money. And the railroad builders turned to London for the capital to build the Illinois Central. And what's more, the early rails and engines were imported from Britain. Well, prior to the railroad, as I just said, um, the pork was shipped down the Mississippi and a lot of pork um, processing was decentralized. So you see that on the, this map, it's all little dots represent pork packing plants, which tended to be on pretty much like any, every, any waterway um, that would give the producers access then to the riverine system to get the pork to market. But with the advent of the railroad, then the shipping could be um, directed towards Chicago, which enabled the concentration in meat packing. And then Chicago, as I said, had the railroad connections to the East Coast, um, which, enabled then shipping uh, also across the Atlantic to Europe. And I'll note that many of the hams and salt pork products um, were not only directed towards Europe, but with the European market in mind, were cut in British styles, packed according to British methods, and some with spices imported from the British empire so that they would be more acceptable to the British market. British commercial agents affected the sales as we can see in the ad to the top, and in most cases, it was British ships that carried the pork across the Atlantic because the US merchant marine carried only a small proportion of US um, overseas trade after the Civil War. As an aside, I'll note that there were horrific conditions on the ships that uh, carried another major meat export um, to Europe, which was live cattle. And there were high death rates and gruesome injuries um, on the ships that carried cattle, live cattle across the Atlantic, leading to one of the earliest animal rights uh, campaigns. And if you look at the caption of this illustration from an 1890 text called Cattle Ships by a um, labor and human rights activist named Samuel Plimsoll, you'll see he describes how um, in stormy conditions, the cattle are all thrown together, the workers on the ship can't even go among them to give them water, they're thrown from side to side in a compact mass until they die. And there are a number of really horrific stories of what that crossing was like for animals. But like beef exports, US pork products ended up feeding the British empire. Not only did British city dwellers buy US pork products, but the British military purchased US pork as well. From polar expeditions to Abyssinian expeditions, British military personnel ate US salt pork. Sometimes British sailors did so despite regulations favoring the domestic product. 
And the way that you can find out about this is that whenever there were diarrhea outbreaks in British ships, they would have an investigation. And in the course of the investigation, it would come to light that even though they weren't supposed to be eating with salt pork because the regulations favoring the British product, it was the US salt pork that was making them sick. Well, many of the British farmers who had been out competed by Midwestern producers packed up for not only London, but places like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa thereby expanding the British Empire. And when they got on those ships to places like New Zealand and Australia, they were entitled by law to a certain amount of salt pork per day on, on the vessels that they were traveling on. So again, it was Midwestern farmers who literally nourished these agents of the British Empire. Back in the Vietnam era, and more specifically in 1969, William Appleman Williams, who taught at the University of Wisconsin for many years, published a book titled The Roots of the Modern American Empire. This book is known for making what was a radical claim in the Cold War context that the United States should be regarded as imperial. In trying to identify the roots of the modern American empire, that is the path to the Spanish-American War in 1898 and subsequent US domination of the Caribbean, Williams zeroed in on farmers. He argued that US farmers in search of export markets for their surpluses clamored for naval building, Panama Canal construction and military incursions. In Williams account, American empire was homegrown. It like literally sprang from the soil. A cartoon to the lower right, which shows a cannon bombarding the rest of the world with corn captures the, the uh, core, perhaps the cob of his argument. And this is thinking about like, how do we imagine the rural Midwest and global context? We imagine it as projecting power and it gets at the desire for export markets in this particular image in Asia, Europe and um, Africa and thinking about um, you know, exports is the one way to understand the Midwest in global context. Well, in contrast to Williams' export-centered model, my point is that imports also mattered, as we have seen by looking at the means of agricultural production. Additionally, it seems that the United States did not become imperial in 1898 because it had been so all along. Not only did Midwestern farmers, many of them emigrants from Britain, colonize the lands of the Kickapoo and other indigenous people, they were also deeply entangled in British imperialism. The United States began to surpass the British Empire by the early 20th century, in part because of its long history of connections to that empire. Midwestern farmers benefited from British genetic material, capital, know-how, transportation infrastructures, and export markets. Those who pushed for naval building did so not only to open up new markets in Asia and Latin America, but also to protect their shipping lanes to their leading customer, Great Britain. And when they pursued markets in Asia and Latin America, they built literally and figuratively on their British ties. By the early 20th century, the British launched Illinois Central Railroad with its southern terminus in New Orleans, had connections to the Caribbean and Panama Canal. It became the leading carrier of bananas and coconuts to US marketplaces. The rise to power that Williams wrote about was not completely homegrown. As the story of the Berkshire Hogs suggests, it emerged from a long history of piggybacking on the British Empire. Now I'm seeing that Andy's down here, so I should wrap it up. Five minutes. Now this is tricky, right? Because I have some optional slides and I have my conclusions. Um, maybe I'll jump to the conclusions and then in the Q&A, maybe I'll jump back to some of the optional slides if, it seems, um, if they seem relevant to your questions. So there are many more stories that I can tell, including ones about all the things on the optional slides, right? About uh, inter-parliamentary union um, activities, about early military aviation, about international students and anti-colonial activism. I can tell you stories about economic ornithology, um, which is using birds for agricultural purposes. Um, meteorology, councillor representation, Eugene Davenport's time in Brazil. Um, but Annie's down here, I'm out of time. So I'm gonna leave you with three conclusions. So the first is, the more that I dug into local history, the more global connections I turned up. So many that I could not cover them all. Like I can't cover them in the talk, I couldn't cover them in the book. There were just too many leads to follow.
Um, so you might be thinking, okay, so we don't live in Illinois, why should we care? Well, my point is that even though my county has its own particular history, you could write an equally global account of any county, I think, in Minnesota. Since local histories teach us to think about our place in the world, approaching local history not only with an eye on what sets us apart from other parts of the world, but also with an eye on how we are connected to others, can counter xenophobic and parochial tendencies helping us to understand how we came to be the way we are today. So my second conclusion is I came to the realization in the course of my research that the heartland is indeed an all American place, but not in the way that the heartland myth suggests. I think it's an all American place for having been thoroughly knit into the wider fabric of the world from the start. The Midwest was a point of encounter and a crossroads before it came to occupy its role in nationalist mythologies as the well-bounded national core. And finally, to return to our starting point, we Midwesterners, I think, deserve better than the myths that have hidden the complexity of our own past. Those who hold up the heartland or the mythical heartland as real America against which other Americans should be judged, not only advance exclusionary ideas about national belonging, but they cut us off from our own past. We deserve open-minded histories that are motivated by curiosity and a desire for understanding, not only because honest accountings are essential to a free and open society, but also because they are far more dramatic, surprising, and meaningful, I think, than myth. So that concludes my, my remarks, and I believe we have time for Q&A. Can you talk a little bit more about land use policies and um, what drove community leaders in that respect? I mean, were they influenced by the British? Uh, you know, obviously it transformed the agricultural nature of the Midwest. So, so what are you getting at with like land use policies? Well, if they were able to tile, right, and um, push out the Kickapoo, that had, there had to be some sort of land use going on that allowed that. Yeah, so, so I'm thinking like, like private land ownership, right, is, is hugely important um, for thinking about um, land use policies. And this may be a bit of digression. I'm not sure if it really gets at what you're talking about. But as you can tell from the aerial scenes I have, the grid, right, is a significant development in land use policies. If you look at, say, colonial New England, it tended to, like, land tended to be carved up among the European arrivals in terms of landmarks, right? It would be like streams rivers, significant um, rocks or outcroppings of trees. And so the fields weren't always square. Um, and if you look at early land use um, among like Canadian um, um, colonists, it often tended, from France, often tended to be really narrow strips of land that would go from rivers, which were important for access to markets, like deep, 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 you know, into the countryside away from the rivers. But the Midwest was laid out in a grid style. And there was a fascinating article a number of years ago in the Journal of American History, which was titled something like why Montana is like Kazakhstan, which was also laid out by like Russian colonialism in the same time period in grid fashion, which was about abstracting land from what was actually on the ground and thinking of it just in terms of a commodity, right? That could be divided up in kind of equal um, portions um, for um, private ownership. You know, so that's something that, um, you know, is coming to mind in terms of thinking about land use. And one more thing about the drainage districts is that they were really important for community governance, that when you look at the political lives of people who are living in places that were draining, um, one of the things that people had to do was work on roads um, so that people would get together to contribute labor to produce roads. But also there are a lot of issues of who's obligated to do what if you're gonna have a drainage system. And so there was a lot of local governance in addition to like state legislation um, that had to do with the different responsibilities of people for tiling and draining so that, you know, like you wouldn't be dumping all the water into somebody else's farm. So those are some comments in regards to that. 
a question. Hi, um, I'm reading your book and I'm really enjoying it, by the way. Uh, one thing that I uh, am a little fuzzy on is what are these local histories that you refer to? Or, or just, I, I, I kind of have a vague sense of what they are, but can you talk more in terms of that, or, or more about them uh, a little bit? And I'm wondering, I think there's a famous multi-volume uh, history of Minnesota by I think someone named Falwell. Is that the kind of a local history if you're familiar with that? Um, so anyway, that's what I'm just trying to understand. What are the local histories you're referring to that set this myth? Yeah, so that's a great um, question. So I think, I think local history writing really emerged as a significant genre in the 19th century. And a lot of those accounts, I think were antiquarian accounts. So I don't think they were about rigorous analysis of anything that was happening. So they were like later accounts that would use local history as a method to get at something like life expectancy or marriage patterns or witchcraft or religious life or things of kind of thematic importance. But the earlier local histories were more like, who are the founding fathers? When was stuff built? And why are we so great? They were really celebratory histories, but they're also exclusionary histories. So there are a ton of transient people passing through like you know, the county I write about, but they don't appear in local histories. You have to use other sources to get at the hobos, for example, who are really important for harvesting um, seasonally. Um, so they tended to be histories of community elites and they were framed in terms of political boundaries. So it would be the, the town, or the county, and I think it scales up, right, to state histories and national histories that assume that the political unit is the unit and nothing crosses the borders of the political unit, that you start with the political unit and you color in the map, right? You figure out what's going on in, in the lives of the people who are living there. And if the stories lead outside of the political unit, you don't follow them. And I have to say in grad school, it was at a time when, because I'm part of computer technology, um, historians were able to do a lot more demographic work. So they could look at things like age of childbirth, um, um, marriage rates, lifespans, and so forth. So there was a real boom in local history writing that was relevatory in terms of the kinds of things that people could discover. But I recall in a grad seminar, somebody saying, well, what about all the people who left? That they're not represented in these histories of people in colonial New England or central Illinois, Sugar Creek is one book that comes to mind. And the answer was at that time, well, it's hard to follow them. And it was before you could just go Google people, right? That it was technically difficult to follow people who leave the community. But when I started doing the research for my book, I realized it's kind of easy to follow indigenous people because Bureau of Indian Affairs records are based on tribal affiliation and they could have been followed and people weren't following them, um, which tells you something then about, you know, whose stories are assumed to be mattered, uh, to, to matter, and then what the technical implications are for different groups of people. And I didn't talk about this in the talk, but for many years after official removal, when the local histories, they start with Hikvus in other indigenous people, they say, oh, you know, the Indians were here, but they all le left. Many years after they seemingly left, there's evidence that people came back and you find it in passing in newspaper articles, if there's an incident, something goes wrong, you realize that oh, there are Kikvu people who were here who were just under the radar screen, they're not captured in the local histories. Um, so it speaks to ongoing attachments to place even on the part of people who are no longer considered to be locals. And one of the slides I didn't have time to get at has to do with a couple uh, who live in a county to the west of Champaign who used their pension fund to build, uh, to buy a plot of land where the grand village of the Kickapoo had been located that um, somebody else was interested in buying in hopes of turning it into a mega hog farm. And this couple realized like this is a, a religiously important place for the Kickapoos and bought it and preserved um, the land. And there have been subsequent reunions. Um, and at least in the initial one, there was a big Kickapoo presence of people who came from Mexico, Oklahoma, um, Texas, other places, and understood it as um, uh, religiously um, and 
um, nationally important site. And one woman in particular was quite elderly and she said like her grandmother had lived in, in the village. And so, you know, she had family stories that were Illinois stories that were still um, meaningful to her. But does that answer your question? Uh, Megan, I think we had an online question. Yes, thank you. We have three online questions. Our first question is, how do you see the influence of the settling of the Midwest by primarily German and Scandinavian migrants contrasting with the way of life and infrastructure organizing of the Scott Irish English roots of the American South, particularly the Appalachian regions? Wow. <laughs> That's a big one. <laughs> Maybe I'll take a pass on that. Um, you know, I'm trying to think because, you know, the histories I've been reading have been focused more on um, more ger German immigrants in terms of where people are coming from. A lot of Irish people came as railroad um, builders, but we're less likely to take up agriculture and then more likely to end up in um, urban areas. As I'm trying to think what to refer you to, the Albion Seed Book um, by David Hackett Fisher comes to mind as a book that may have engaged in themes like that. And I'm just reluctant to say in a public gathering, um, you know, how much of different political leanings came from prior cultural practices and outlooks and systems and how much has to do with where people ended up. So I think I'll take a pass on that. Great, I'm being told we have time for one more from the Zoom call. Um, so economic ornithology, please explain. Thank you, I love to talk about economic ornithology. So I can go back to my very, uh, actually it may not show up with the captioning, let's see. My very first um, slide that has the, the picture of um, central Illinois. And let's see if at the bottom, we can see that um, they're hunting birds. So one of the things I discovered in the course of doing the research, ah, you can just barely see it on here. Um, oh, actually you can't. can. Can you move the captions to the side? Yeah, so, so these people are hunting um, birds. So I hadn't realized how important birds were for protein for rural people and started, until I started doing the research. And the thing that took me off to it is I became interested in the idea of flyover country and just how dismissive it is to assume that the perspective of the person in the airplane looking down in a dismissive way is the perspective that mattered. And I was interested in what it meant to be flown over and to look up and to think about air as something that enabled connection across vast distances, including in the age of um, early wireless communication, the birth of aviation, long distance balloon races were a real thing. And they were launched from the Midwest because you don't want the balloons to go down over water, right? So you would launch the, the balloons from the heart of the continent. And then it led me to, to birds among other, other things. Um, and the effort to track their migrations. So birds were important for protein, um, but they were also important for insect pest control before the age of uh, synthetic uh, pesticides. And so there were a lot of studies of birds, which were considered to be, you know, they might peck at your apples and so forth, a menace to crops. But then scientists, um, began to dissect the uh, cross birds and to see what they were eating and realize that they were actually major eaters of insects. And so that gave rise to Audubon type efforts to protect birds. And a logic of it was that it's a food security issue. It's not just biodiversity or we love birds because they're, they're beautiful animals and songbirds make lovely sounds, but our food supply depends on the protection of birds. So that's economic ornithology is you, you know, realizing the economic significance of birds. And I should say this is in the context of plummeting bird populations. And one of the implications of the tiling and draining is it reduced wetlands. So birds, you think of the Mississippi Flyway now and, and just how important it is for certain migratory birds. Um, but prior to the tiling and draining, you know, the quarter was much bigger because the fields were so ponding and wet and everything was so swampy, right? The habitats were much bigger. And so because of habitat destruction um, through things like, um, you know, industrial agriculture, 
and through draining wetlands, bird populations began to plummet, including of birds that were eaten for food um, and including of the birds that were understood as uh, pest eaters. And farmers became a significant constituency in early bird preservation efforts. And one of the things they became really interested in is where do the birds go in the winter when they realized that they only had so much control that they could take local steps to protect bird populations, but local steps wouldn't be enough for migratory uh, birds. So the point of all that in terms of thinking about um, flyover country is geographic imaginings and how farmers in the Midwest were positioning themselves in hemispheric context once they realized, whoa, you know, there are birds that, that spend part of their life in the Arctic Circle and part of their life um, in um, Central America as far as South America, and our ecology is connected to those ecologies. In the book, I tell one of my, my favorite people in the book is somebody named Elmer Ekblav, who was an ornithologist, and I found him through keyword searching in newspapers. I was like searching for different bird words, and he came up in repeated hits. So I started looking into him more. And because of his expertise in ornithology, he participated in a polar expedition and spent a couple of years wintering over in Greenland, where he lived with um, indigenous people who survived um, for certain months of the year on um, birds who, who kept them from starvation. And he, he got like how important the arrival of the migratory birds were for their survival. Um, later, he became uh, an important geographer, um, wrote and published widely. And one of the things that just like really caught my attention is that even though he understood as an ornithologist and as someone who had lived in Greenland, just how important um, connections to the wider world were for survival, in his own writings, it was always about trying to identify like the inner core and essence of people. And when he wrote about people in Greenland, he didn't admit like, you know, Danish colonization, there were trade contacts, they have, you know, um, relations with people like me who are polar explorers. He always insisted that they were cut off from the rest of the world and wrote about them as people who were cut off in contrast to other writers who said, actually, the the trade networks have profoundly infected, affected um, indigenous people in Greenland, but ECWA was always about localizing people, even though he was an ornithologist who, by virtue of his passion, realized just how interconnected people are. Wonderful, thank you, Kristen, so much for joining us here today for the History Forum.